welcome to Math is Fundamental. Today we're going to be talking about trapezoids and kites. So let's look at the first definition, which is a trapezoid. We have a trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides. So it's only allowed to have one pair of parallel sides because if it had two pairs, it'd be a parallelogram instead of a trapezoid. So here I have one pair of parallel sides. The other sides cannot be parallel. An isosceles trapezoid is a trapezoid with congruent legs. So here is our parallel sides and the two sides that are not parallel are the legs. We call those the legs and those are congruent. The two parallel sides are what we call the bases. These two are bases and these two are legs. So just kind of terminology for you. Um, each pair of base angles of an isosceles trapezoid are congruent. So here, this one's congruent to that one, and these two are congruent. Remember, base angles doesn't necessarily just mean the ones on the bottom. It means the angles that are connected to the bases, and in a trapezoid, we have two bases, the two sides that are parallel to each other. All right, and we know in an isosceles trapezoid that its diagonals are congruent as well. So here, let's see if I can draw this. We've got one diagonal here, another diagonal here, and this diagonal is congruent to that diagonal. So only all that stuff only happens in an isosceles trapezoid, so make sure you're given that information before you assume anything. All right, next we have mid-segment of a trapezoid, which is the segment that connects the midpoints of the legs of a trapezoid. So here, if I have the midpoint of this leg and the midpoint of this leg, then our mid-segment is going to be the segment that connects those two midpoints. Now, if you remember back from a couple chapters ago, we talked about mid-segment of a triangle and those properties the mid-segment of a trapezoid, the properties are going to be the same, almost, just a little different, but it's going to be very close to the same. So our two properties is that the mid-segment has to be parallel to our bases. So all three of these sides have to be parallel to each other. And the length of the mid-segment is half of the sum of the lengths of the bases. Remember, unlike a triangle, which had only one base, here we have two bases in a trapezoid, so we have to take the average of those two bases to get the length of our mid-segment. All right, so let's look at a couple examples. We're going to set up an equation and show all the steps. Um, which might take a little while, but you'll see these examples can get a little complicated. We want to make sure we really know how to solve them. All right, so here we have our mid-segment is 10 and our two bases there. So in order to set up our equation, I know that the length of the mid-segment equals half of the sum of 3x minus 1, one of our bases, and 7x plus 1. So a little bit of a complicated formula. Now, we could, if we wanted to, we could do a whole bunch of stuff from at this point. My suggestion, simplify what's inside the parentheses first. So 10 equals 1 half, 3x plus 7x is 10x, negative 1 plus 1 actually cancels itself out. All right, so that was kind of nice. Um, and then at this point, we could distribute the 1 half in, or multiply 1 half times 10x. We get 10 equals 5x and divide by five, and x is going to be two. So there were a couple different ways we could have gone about that, but that one seemed to work really nicely. All right, b is going to also be a mid-segment. If you notice, they give us the lengths of these sides, which are both equal, and these ones. So I know that those are midpoints, which makes that the mid-segment. All right, so I can set this up. The length of the mid-segment equals half of the sum of 48 and 10x. All right, so from here, we can distribute that 1 half in. Since both of those are even numbers, it's a little easier. If they weren't even, we could have just multiplied both sides of our equation by 2. 
to get rid of the one half. Um, but these are even, so it's nice and, and, and equal. Oops. So half of 48 is 24 plus 5x. Now, if you notice, we have a quadratic equation to solve here, which means we got to think all the way back to algebra. We need to subtract and move everything over to one side of the equation. So here I'm going to have x squared move the 5x over, turn it negative, and move the 24 over so that everything is equal to 0. At this point, we can try to factor or we can try to use the quadratic formula. I love factoring, so I always try to do that first. I find it's easier to get our answers if we can factor. So we've got, let's see, x squared is going to be x times x, negative 24. I can do 8 times 3. I need it to be a negative 5, so make that 8 negative positive 3. And we can always FOIL to check or distribute to check to make sure that our factors are are right and that they actually do give us that x squared minus 5x minus 24. Now from here to solve, we use what's called the zero product property, which is x minus 8 equals 0 and x plus 3 equals 0. So we can just split them up and set each one of them equal to 0 and solve. So if I add 8, I have x equals 8. And if I subtract 3, I have x equals negative 3. Now the problem with geometry, unlike algebra, is that those aren't necessarily both of our answers because we're limited by the geometric properties of our figure. If I plug my numbers in, they may or may not work. So let's see, if I plug 8 in, I get 80 here. 8 times 8 is 16. Oh, I'm sorry, 8 times 8 is 64. And then that one's 48. And yeah, 64 is in the middle of 48 and 80. So the 8 definitely works. I checked it and we're good. Now if I plug in negative 3 here, 10 times negative 3 is negative 30 to negative 30, and negative 3 squared is 9. Well, we can't have a negative length. So even if 9 was in the middle of those two things, we're not allowed to have a negative length. So this answer does not work. So we have to always think in geometry of plugging our answers back into our shapes and making sure that they don't violate any laws of physics, like having negative lengths. We're not allowed. All right, uh, let's look at our next piece. So a kite is a quadrilateral oops, with two pairs of consecutive congruent sides. So consecutive, remember, means kind of uh, next in line or, in, or next to or in order. So these two sides are going to be congruent and these two sides are going to be congruent. And if you notice, opposite sides in a kite are not congruent in this case. All right, uh, now properties of a kite, that was our definition. Properties is that the diagonals of a kite, if we draw our diagonals and look at those, diagonals are going to be perpendicular. And one pair of opposite angles are congruent but only one pair. And it happens to be this pair here. The other pair of angles are not going to be congruent, so be careful. All right, so let's look at these ones. We're gonna set up some equations, solve for some variables. All right, so in kite A, B, C, D, A, B is congruent to AD, B, C is congruent to CD, A, B is three X minus three, B, C is X plus eight, CD is y plus 7, and DA is 2y plus 5. Always use your diagram and write your information on your diagram so you can figure out what you have. So now if I look at my information and pair up my congruent sides, I have 3x minus 3 equals 2y plus 5. But I can't solve for x and y with that equation because I have two unknowns. Lucky for us, we have another set of congruent sides. So I can make two equations with two unknowns, and then I can solve using substitution or elimination. Um, in this case, I think maybe substitution would be easier. If I get eight by, or sorry, x by itself, 
x equals y minus 1, I can take that x value and plug it in to the first equation. 3 times y minus 1 minus 3 equals 2y plus 5. And then I distribute, and let's see if we can solve this thing. We've got 3y minus 6. So if I add 6 to both sides, that cancels out and subtract my 2y. I'm running out of room here. y is going to be 11. And again, we want to kind of plug it in to make sure it works. It doesn't make anything negative. 11 plus 7 is 18. And 2y plus 5 is not negative. So here we've got a y value that works. All right. Now to find x, we take the y value, we plug it in, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go like this. 11 plus 7 is 18, and if I know that this side also has to be 18, I can make some smaller equations like that. So x plus 8, so then has to be 18, so then x would have to equal 10 in order for that to work. And there I've solved for x and y. All right, let's look at B. We have a kite, and we know that in a kite, the diagonals are perpendicular to each other. I need to find HP, so I'm gonna put an X there, and if you notice, I've made myself a nice little right triangle. So I can use Pythagorean theorem and set up X squared plus five squared equals the square root of 29 squared, and when we square a square root, the square root disappears. So we've got x squared plus 25 equals 29, x squared equals 4. Now when I take the square root to solve, x is going to be plus or minus 2 because positive 2 squared is 4, but so is negative 2 squared. Remember, in geometry, we can't have any negative lengths. And if we look at x and I use negative 2, now I'm left with a negative length. So my only answer here should be our positive 2. All right, and our last example, we have a kite. RS is congruent to RU. ST is congruent to TU. The measure of R is X plus 30 degrees, and the measure of T is X, and the measure of U is 125. Now, remember, in a kite, we have one pair of angles that are congruent to each other, but it's not the X and the X plus 30 angles. If we look up here, it's the angles in between the two non-congruent sides that are going to be congruent to each other. So here, if u is 125, then I know that s also has to be 125. And because a kite is a quadrilateral, then all the interior angles have to add up to 360 degrees. So I can set up my equation by adding all four angles together to be 360 degrees and doing a little bit of math, saving us some time, we're going to get x equals 40. And then it says, um, oh, and that's it. We don't actually have to do anything else. Sometimes we have to plug it back in to find the measures of those angles, but in this case, it didn't ask us to. So there we go, we have our x value. All right. And that concludes our lesson for today. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, math is fundamental.